<laughs> okay, it's working. I think it's working. Okay, right, we're live. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everything went wrong, but it's okay. It's okay. We we adapt and we overcome. <laughs> Do you guys want to like introduce yourself while I send out a tweet? <laughs> sure, and make sure you share it to us. Yeah. I'm Exit. Um, I focus on the Black Sea Grain Initiative and hold some spaces with Mr. Bond and come and chat with these guys all the time. And they're great. Hi. Yeah, so I'm Charles. Um former combat engineer in the US Army. I like to talk about things that go boom. Um and yeah, come and hang out with these guys a lot and work on some other projects on Twitter. Such as well, there's one called Tochni that we have uh, every Sunday and sometimes during the week. We talk about military, pol politics, um, stuff from Ukraine. Oh, yeah. And what what day, what days do those air? Excuse me? What day does it air? Oh, it's on Sundays. Uh, I guess if you're in North America, it'd probably be around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. So I'm in Europe, so I don't... Don't know what time it is where you guys live. Yeah, it's about it noon. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's, it's noon, noon in in central time, right? Or or mountain time, noon mountain time. Yeah. Uh, two Eastern time. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and also, um, yeah. So so there's there's Tachni and Exit also does a sh uh, a Twitter space with um with Bond on on Sundays. Not always, but uh well I mean the the Twitter space is always on Sunday. But actually it's not always there. But uh but yeah that's also a good space. Uh yeah. It's at uh four PM, right? So you can you can listen to Tachni at two, it goes to four, and then the bond space starts at four and goes long <laughs> like like three plus hours usually, right? Perfect description. <laughs> It goes for a while. It usually ends at like seven or eight or something. Uh, yeah. So that's that's what you can do on Sundays if you choose to. Or you can listen to uh, the replays. Because uh, I know Toch, uh, Tochni uh, uploads to um, various podcast things, right? Yeah. we Most people listen on Spotify, but it's also on Apple Podcasts and I don't remember the whole list of all the other places that we've put it up on, but uh, pretty much everywhere. And that usually comes out like the next day, like on Monday or Tuesday, it comes out. Yeah. And uh, th does the Bond space get uh, re-uploaded? I know it goes to YouTube sometimes. It goes to YouTube most of the time. Uh, I hear tell that we are working on getting it uploaded to some other offerings, but I don't believe that that is complete at the moment. Okay. It's a valuable space. I think it, it should be um, saved somewhere in a podcast. Uh, I agree. Yeah, I will so, bring that uh, up. So I'll, I'll, I'll link to uh, Tachni. Uh, it is it is this account on on the Twitters, um, this one right here. Uh, touch me. Uh, I will I'll put it in the description. Um, there, it's in the description now. Uh, okay. And. Uh, And this is Bond. Hello, Mr. Bond. That's his name. Uh, you can listen to uh, his space, which is about open source intelligence. Um, not necessarily about Ukraine, but just um, generally speaking, open source intelligence. Although, obviously, Ukraine is one of the, the main topics discussed because that's kind of the most relevant thing going on at the moment. Um, although there are other things, too. Uh, like uh, the merchant marine discussions were my favorite. I, I really like the merchant marine stuff. Um, I will bring that up. That's awesome. Maybe we'll have them back. Yeah, I, I just think it's it's really interesting because <laughs> it's it's something that you like never hear talk about. Um, but anyways, 
Does he like his OSINT shaken or stirred? Uh, I don't know. I will have to ask Mr. Bond. <laughs> I will OSINT that question and come back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the people have, have rejoined the stream, which is nice. Um, we actually have more now than when it went very badly. So, uh, Constantine, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Great, great. Thank you for having me here, and great to see everyone here. Yeah. So, um, so I guess um, uh, I'm just going to start with the news, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, first... The northern section. I don't. I really have no news around here. Constantine, do you know? Do you have any news about like the Kupiansk area? I don't have anyone there in in the Kupiansk area. So or or um, Novoselivska or Kuzemivka or any yeah. anything like that. Any of that whole area. Yeah. <laughs> no one is there anymore. Okay. So I don't have, yeah. Sorry. All right. Yeah. So I have basically no information about this area. So um, there's some stuff I could glean from um, the satellite imagery. Uh, I've noticed um, that Ukraine has moved up. Uh, so this, I'm just going to zoom out and say where I am. So this is uh, Kuzemivka and Novoselivska. Um, this, this, you know, this has been a, a frontline town for a long time. So it seems that very recently, like in the past, uh, I don't know, two weeks, like, t like 10 to 14 days, sometime in the past 10 to 14 days, Ukraine has moved up this tree line and captured this position here. Um, Andrew? Yes? Us three can't see your screen. Do you mind sharing, please? Oh, yeah. I, I forgot. I had to reset my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I didn't share it. Uh, one sec. To remember all the buttons to click to do this. Okay. So resharing the screen. Um, there. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so I'll zoom out again. Uh, so this is Kuz, uh, Kuzemivka, Novoselivska. Um, over the past like 10 to 14 days, Ukraine has moved up this tree line and apparently captured this position, um, which is the kind of the intersection of these. I don't even know if this is a tree line. Anyway, it's the intersection of this tree line and this this highway. It's kind of a major highway. So uh, they, they, they seem to have captured this position here and, and very likely um, this position on this tree line. Um, so this, this, they basically control the highway now. Um, they may have also captured whatever this thing is. And um, it's like some farm thing. Actually, actually, I think it may have been a hotel um, before it was demolished by artillery. But anyways, so um, they may control that as well. I'm not really sure. But there's also seems to be heavy fighting going on in this tree line, which is, you know, directly east from these positions. So it's possible that they've just kept going and there seems to be um, heavy fighting here and, and the heavy fighting in the form of um, all the trees are gone. They don't exist anymore because they all exploded. Okay. And uh, similarly, there's some like these trees and these houses and this kind of like this, these like two or three streets right here are all deleted. So, and this is all over the course of the past like 10 days. So it, it appears that Ukraine moved up, maybe captured these positions, kept going. Perhaps they entered this forest and perhaps kept going. Um, uh, this forest here, um, which is just south of it, south of Kuzimivka, uh, has no signs of combat at all. And I believe it is still in Russian control. And um, yesterday, uh, the Ukrainian general staff stated that there was fighting west of, um, I, don't, I should have looked up how to say this word, uh, Kazidi, can you help me? <laughs> anyway, so there's fighting west of this town. Uh, I'm going I'm to try it. Uh, Krivivoshivka? Uh, you got to zoom in. It's too small for me. Uh, every time I zoom in, it gets smaller. Krivivoshivka. <laughs> uh, uh, Krivoshivka. Okay. Uh, so there's fighting west of this town. Um, 
which I interpret as west of this forest, which is basically the whole area I was just talking about. So um, I, I, I believe Russia is trying to flush Ukraine out of these positions. That is my interpretation of the Ukrainian general staff stating that um, Russia is attacking west from this town. Um, this this forest belt to uh, the south is also appears to be untouched by by combat. It's it's only um, this section of highway and this forest here that uh, this forest strip along the, the the train line that is in combat apparently. Um, is this satellite imagery free? Uh, <laughs> Um, what do you mean? Do, do you mean Sentinel or what we're looking at here? Because what we're looking at here is just my map. Uh, you can go to the, the link is in the stream. So it's just map.ukrainedailyupdate.com. But uh, I, I can show the, the Sentinel image. Um, so I will go there, I guess. And we can see that these forests have been deleted by artillery. Uh, it's going to take a second to load because Sentinel's really slow. But anyways, uh, I'll load it off screen. Um, Novoselivska is this town right here. It is right next to Kuzemivka. Uh, Ukraine captured this a long time ago. In January, right? They finished it. Um, I think it was January. But they there was fighting there like all... All autumn and winter. Okay, so here is the satellite as soon as it renders. Okay, so here is... Uh, oh. I don't know what day is safe to go to. But anyways, this is this is like uh, last week. Um, you see there's uh, these tree line destroyed. Uh, there's... Signs of fighting here, signs of fighting here, lots of signs of fighting here, and these trees are getting deleted, and there's more here deleted. And in the more recent uh, imagery, it's even worse than this. This is imagery from the second, which is five days ago. So that's that. Okay, so th that's really all the information I have about this whole area. <laughs> um, today, there was a, a video of... Ukraine shelling um, this town, which is uh, Dre, uh, Drel, <laughs> Drelna, right? Anyway, so they, they're shelling this house right here in Drelna. So if we zoom out, it is right at the kind of the southern section of this town. It's getting pretty heavily shelled. Not a super interesting video, but it, uh, you know, that's, uh, this is really all the information I have here. There's, there's really not much else to talk about. Uh, Constantine doesn't know anyone here. I don't know anyone here. Uh, there's not much written about it. Um, so I don't know anyone anywhere now. I'm, I, I got, you know, for a week, I, I fell out of everything. It happens. It happens to all of us, you know. Um, and similarly around Kremena, I really don't have any specific information at all. Uh, we know that, you know, Russia went on their attack. Um, Ukraine kind of took back all the positions they lost, which some people called a counteroffensive or counterattack or whatever. I don't know if counterattack's the right word as much as, I don't, I don't know, whatever word you want to use to describe that. Ukraine kept all their positions. Um, uh, over here, um, Russia has tons of artillery. That's where their artillery is. Um, the, the locals in this area have been crying on Telegram about how these guns are scaring them, etc. Um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, a report today from Kremena, which was <laughs> kind of interesting. It was about how um, one of the like pro-Russian uh, government people, I guess is the term, um, he was talking about how it, he he finds it interesting that when Kremena was under threat from the Russian advance, Ukraine brought in buses and helped evacuate everybody. But now that Kremena is under threat from the Ukrainian attack, the Russians are not helping evacuate anyone and are 
uh, above and beyond that, not even allowing people to leave. Um, like they're like, like I'm like, like you, you can leave on, like, it's not like they're holding them hostage, but they're not like, they're not issuing any sort of like evacuation notices. They're not bringing in buses to help people. They're not doing anything like they, they're, uh, they're just leaving people there basically as if nothing is going on. Um, but anyways, uh, so I kind of just want to skip through this whole section because I, I don't have much to talk about. And I know Exit and, and Charles and Constantine also don't have anything to talk about this area. So uh, I'm just kind of blazing through as fast as I can. Um, Bilo Horivka, don't really have anything to talk about. Uh, so we have uh, Verkno Kamianska, no news. Uh, Sperna, no real news. Um, Vaseli, uh, the Russians have been trying to attack up this... Uh, this, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the word is. Uh, anyway, they're, they're moving up. They're trying to get into this tree line. It's hard to see the tree line. Anyway, they're trying to get into that tree line and move up into the town, but they've made absolutely no progress. And at the same time, Ukraine is pushing south, closer and closer to Yakovlivka and Solodar. They're actually like unreasonably close to Solodar at this point. Um, it's it's uh, kind of shocking. How close they are um, from this northern approach, which uh, Russia bombed heavily with um, aviation today. Um, they bombed this whole this whole area with aviation. Uh, with Rostolivka, you know, Russia is trying to counterattack. Um, no new changes. So uh, <clears throat> that's kind of the whole burning through the top of the map because there's not much to talk about. Now. Um, in Berhivka, there's been news of um, of Ukrainian advances, um, and the advances are not super substantiated. And I, I'll tell you why I say that. First, um, there was an FPG uh, F FPV drone strike right here in the very southern approach of Berhivka. And this, this video um, was somewhat interesting because the Russian soldiers here didn't look like they were really in combat. They were kind of walking casually as if they were under no threat of being shot. So it, it really kind of shows that they're, this position is not near the front line. Now, I don't know when this video was filmed, um, it seems like it's not today <laughs> because the the video is very sunny and I don't think it's sunny there right now. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, anyway, so and, and in, in addition to that, uh, Ukraine blew up a T-80 BV up here. Um, I don't know. So, Charles, I, I'm curious... We, we've 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 talked about this town a lot. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen it, like the 3D views and everything. Um, what do you, what do you think it would take for Ukraine to uh, successfully assault a town like this? Uh, I'm I'm gonna bring up the the 3D view. I'm I'm just curious what what your take on assaulting this town is. Why why do you think Ukraine has been uh, kind of stuck? Yeah, um, that's a that's a good question. Why they're stuck? I I, I actually would have thought that. Um, well, the first thing I think um, I think you and I, Constantine, talked about this a little bit before on another village, another town with similar terrain. Is you know to get to the to the bluffs or to the hills overlooking the town because most of these towns are inside the um, inside these river valleys. And the west side of these river valleys uh, tends to be much sharper than the east side of the river valleys. They're steeper. Um, so they really do overlook these towns quite nicely. Um, and to be able to first just get direct fire, direct observation over them with mortars, tanks, snipers, etc. Um, however, I still... Um, 
I'm still of the opinion that I don't think it is the wisest move for Ukrainian forces to try to get into urban battles. Um, it, it depends on the unit and what firepower they have and stuff like this. Um, I mean, if you don't have a lot of mechanization, then yeah, getting into the town makes sense. But if you do have the ability to use tanks or IFVs or APCs to bypass it and just um, continue to have direct overwatch on it, I think that's that's the best way. Um, so we'll see what the Ukrainians decide to do. I mean... I think in this area, we don't have like the big mechanized brigades from the Ukrainians. I mean, they do have some, but not like we see on the Southern front, you know, with the, the Western equipment. Um, but certainly getting to this point of overwatch, like on the edge of the spur, like you see in front of us, um, is step one. What kind of surprises me, well, I guess it doesn't really surprise me as much, but we see a lot that both sides are using these ravines as cover and concealment. Um, so they, I think even the one you showed before, like north of Solidar, it looked like the Ukrainians were making their pushes up these ravines. And then, you know, they had kind of an issue to try to get up on top of the hill. Um, on this side, it's just kind of in reverse you know, I guess these Russian soldiers can be adequately supplied through these ravines. Um, and so it's hard to sort of push the Russians to the edge of the slope, if, if that makes sense. Um, but that would be step one to, to get that direct overwatch. Cause th these bluffs are actually, these, these hills are actually quite large over this, these towns. The, the, uh, the vertical is, is exaggerated by 300%. So it's, it is more flat than this. This is just the, you know, to help see it. <laughs> Otherwise everything looks like a pancake. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I know in this visual it is, but I think even when I looked at the topographic map, um, you know, you're looking, I want to say the elevation change just in, just within Bakhmut itself from like the top of the hill where the big um, apartment blocks are down to the bottom is like 70 meters or something like that. I think it's similar in a lot of these towns where the hill to the west, like the steeper bluff, is can be up to like 100 meters above the river level at the bottom. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty large. I, I mean, not if you live in like Appalachia or something like that, but from military sense, you can see quite far from those. Yeah, so I'm 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 looking at this uh, this hill that overlooks uh, Bakhmut. So this the top of this hill is 170 meters, and this water is about 100 meters. So this is it's about 70 meters on this on this one particular hill. Uh, that's not it's not terrible. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, and uh, this this hill here is. Um, this is 150 meters, and this low ground where Ukraine is is 115. So this is about 35 meter difference, um, and it's a 35 meters over. I don't know uh, what's this distance. So uh, it's 35 meters over um, 500 meters. So that's that's not a, a little bit of slope to it. <laughs> it's, uh, Right, but it also it allows you like if it's it's not that you need necessarily the Overwatch just to be able to see the town, but then once you have the Overwatch, then you can see the approaches in and out, um, and you can cut them off with mortar and artillery and whatever. And yeah, I mean drones can be used as well, but I think as Constantine can attest, like it's considerably easy to see something like with your own eyes than it is to have to use a drone to see it. Um, it's just more reliable and it's longer and you're not risking drones yeah and, and this it, this this tree line seems pretty nice too because it's like um you know lower i can't remember the word for this it's not at the the peak it's like lower on the hill i get what's the word for that yeah we call it the, mili the military crest <laughs> yeah what that's, what it's, it. that's what it's called so uh this 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 tree line is like a natural like uh military defense i guess uh 
So yeah, this is um anyway, so Ukraine is steadily progressing in this area. Um, but it's you know, it's like fifty meters here, a hundred meters there. It's not um anything super impressive. Um now if we if I I'll just kinda like talk through it. So uh Ukraine controls this forest right here. Um they control um approximately this part of this forest but not this part so they control like here here is probably a gray area and here is a gray area uh this forest here is in the uh russian control uh this forest is very likely ukrainian controlled and all of this all this uh area south is ukrainian controlled uh this racetrack was never lost at any point um so uh, that is def that's like kind of like a Ukrainian strong point. Uh, this this road is um, you know what they called the road of life that we uh, saw lots of stories about and we read a, a personal account from one of Constantine's friends about that. So that was interesting. Um, now this uh, this section here was uh, I believe not a hundred percent sure, but I believe this was recently. Um, retaken by Ukraine, and I believe that they've pushed up to approximately here, and this area is either Russian-controlled or a gray area, and I believe up to here is uh, Ukrainian-controlled. Um, this kind of lower forest area, on which is like on this reservoir, um, I don't know who controls that. It's likely a, a gray area. And does the water sorry to interrupt um does the water play into the tactical um control of things like is it a benefit or a hindrance or it depends on who you are in this situation do you want it for things other than tactical movements like is the water just beneficial because then you don't have to go searching for water like to drink Charles, you want to answer that? Well, 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 in that case, I don't think that water's there anymore. I think that dam was blown, uh, I don't remember, maybe back in November or something like that, December. Um, so I don't I don't know what exactly what it looks like right now. I would expect it's, you know, kind of a, a wetlands kind of uh, tall reeds and things like that. So then it would provide some kind of concealment. Um, in terms of sources of water... Um, it could be if it were there, uh, you could use it, uh, for water. I, I mean, that's what it, that's, that's the reason why they're dammed anyway. So yeah, you could, that would be, a uh, something you could do in terms of, uh, water. Like it's generally all water obstacles tend to favor the defense and being behind them. And you know, that the enemy has to go around them. Um, or in some cases go over them, but uh, this is a really small one. Um, but in general, water should favor the defense, just like the canal um, south of Bakhmut. Uh, it tends to favor the defense because even though it's not a huge obstacle, it still has to be crossed in places. And uh, those places can be predicted or they can be interdicted with artillery um, or whatever. So... So it does but play the, a role. The same would be true up around the bluff. If you're defending the bluff, then the fact that it has water kind of down yeah. around the bottom of it would be yeah. a benefit. Then this water, um, this water under this this bluff thing, uh, this water doesn't exist anymore. Um, this okay. is almost entirely on, empty. Uh, this this other one, I think it does still exist because uh, this is the satellite imagery here. Um, it does show water here, so uh, I think this one still exists. At least, uh, at least it's like half full. This other one is, um, uh, there's some in, in this kind of Eastern part where it's deeper, but I think this is only like a meter deep at this point. So this is almost entirely empty. This, uh, this dam blew up. Uh, it was destroyed. I, I'm not entirely sure who destroyed it. Um, at the time Ukraine said Russia did and Russia said Ukraine did. So I, I really don't know who blew up that dam. It didn't seem to accomplish literally anything. So uh, I'm not really sure what the purpose was, but uh, the, the dam was destroyed. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess we can 
look at this this imagery to tell you why I think Ukraine is in the positions they are. Um, we we can see right here. Uh, I'm gonna go into false color mode. I'm sorry if this sears your eyes, but it does help. It, it's extremely painful to me to actually. I don't even want to look at it. <laughs> Take it back. Go back. Okay. Um, okay. So this position uh, right here is uh, being heavily shelled. Uh, this position is also getting heavily shelled. All of these forest strips have been completely destroyed. Uh, these forest strips, uh, see, this is the racetrack I was talking about. All these forest strips are just gone. They've all been shelled to nothingness. Um, and, and Russians aren't here. So I, I can tell you, Russians are not here. This was at best a gray area, and it's almost certainly controlled by Ukraine. This forest is gone Um from Russian shelling here, uh, and these forests are all destroyed by Russian shelling. This position is 100% Ukrainian controlled. That's completely confirmed. Um, these two forests are very likely Ukrainian controlled, and this one is likely a gray area. This is probably a gray area too, and this is definitely Russian controlled. So, uh, and, and, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the, the visual evidence that I use. I know like on, on Telegram and on and uh, Twitter, there are a lot of uh, offensives on social media that may not correspond to reality, but um, I think the, the satellite imagery kind of speaks for itself that uh, these areas that are completely 100% destroyed are almost certainly in Ukrainian control because Ukraine just doesn't have the artillery to erase entire forests with uh, artillery shells. They it's not really their style and they don't really have the capability to do it in the first place. So, um, there would be, if, if Ukraine had that ammo, they would be using it for a, a better purpose than erasing a forest. Uh, anyways, so, um, getting, getting to the Bakhmut, uh, there, there are lots of rumors that Ukraine has entered Bakhmut. Um, I don't really want to talk about those rumors because they're not super interesting to me. But what is interesting to me is that Russia is shelling um, this these this forest strip here and this forest strip here next to Bakhmut. So um, Ukraine is basically edging their way into the the outskirts of Bakhmut, and uh, I'll show it on this map. Um, so they're. Ukraine is basically fighting their way up to this forest strip and this forest strip, and now Russia is shelling both of them, and we have uh, video evidence to show this much. Um, I don't have the video in hand. Uh, <laughs> actually, let me let me find it. Um, do one of one of you want to talk about something while I look for it? Uh, oh. Yeah, that would. I mean, that's, that would be interesting to see whether they would decide to go back into Bakhmut or not. Um, like I said, I, I don't think that it's, unless they really had overwhelming uh, combat power, I just don't know if I would, if I were the Ukrainians to be looking to go into cities um, uh, against the Russians. I think that their advantage... What happened? <laughs> uh, we lost trans. Trails, you disappeared. Um, anyway, I, I first of all, I, I wanted to add to it as well. I don't think Ukraine like it, it, Ukraine creates a pressure to to keep uh, the troops under uh, under the under the pressure in the city. But at the same time, I, I don't believe there is a plan to enter it and, and drag yourself into urban combat at this moment before before you take over the flanks. Uh, 
Andrew, are you thinking? Uh, uh, no, I, I, uh, I'm scared to show more than that. So that, that is as much as I'm willing to show, but th- those images are from, uh, from Buckmoot. Um, anyways, Charles, you're back. You kind of like, um, it sounded like you got eaten by a robot and then you disappeared, <laughs> but you're back. Anyways, uh, I just use Sentinel for free. Sentinel, uh, I don't have a, a plan. <laughs> uh, yeah, Charles, Charles got abducted. Anyways, oh, Charles is back. Um, anyway, so we can uh, kind of move on, I guess. Uh, so anyway, so the that shelling is from from these forests. You you could see like a pond. This is the pond that was in that video. I'm kind of scared to show more of the video because it it eventually, if I remember right, it shows people dying, and I don't don't want to get like uh like banned from YouTube. <laughs> like I was from uh from Twitch already. <laughs> Sick of getting banned for places. Anyway, so um so yeah. Uh yeah, I I um I kind of think Ukraine will enter Bakhmut, personally. I think they will go into Bakhmut. Um I don't think they'll expend a ton of resources doing it. And I don't think they need to. I think just Having a presence in Bakhmut would be demoralizing for the Russians. Um, yeah, I could see, I could see that. I mean, I, I mean, if the information or political value or you know the morale value you could get out of it would be worth it, then I, that would make sense. I just, I think. Nope, we lost Charles again. Uh, Gone. But I, I think, um, for example, I, I, I think that Ukraine could enter kind of this part of Bakhmut, um, basically everywhere um, west of this main road, um, and they could occupy this area. I think with with a small number of resources, they could pull this off, um, uh, kind of entering just just this basically these like two or three blocks of the city um and similarly i think they could also enter kind of this section of the city um Is i don't there anything in those two sections to actually occupy though like just even to defend there are there are prepared positions that they had um when they left and those prepared positions are currently held by by russian forces um, which is, mm. is kind of the issue. <laughs> They're using Ukraine's own defenses. Okay. So um, uh, I I don't think that Ukraine will try to recapture the whole city. That seems incredibly unlikely to me. But holding on to one or two blocks, I think they have the resources to do that. And it would be demoralizing. It would be it would be bad for Russia to have videos of Bakhmut in the news, <laughs> it would be bad. I think, uh, I think it would be upsetting to them, um, on a, on a number of political levels. And I think it would also kind of fan the flames of Prigozhin, um, his kind of, uh, kind of mini, <laughs> uh, mutiny that he, we had where he was based. Really yeah. He was basically saying, I'm better than our military. Look at what I've accomplished that our military can't do. Um, if you have videos of Ukraine in Bakhmut, um, they don't need to take the whole city, just, just in the city. Like if they like if there's like a guy right here standing next to this building right there, uh, posting a video on Telegram or TikTok or whatever, um, I think that could get the pro Prigozhin people riled up. Um, that sort of fanning of the flames, I think, has its own political value um, beyond just military stuff. And just to be clear, it is the Russian regular forces that are currently holding Bakhmut for the most part? Yes. I've heard it's their airborne, the VDV. 
Huh. Interesting. <laughs> Would Putin send Wagner back in? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, like, imagine, imagine being Wagner and capturing. They didn't. Even, they never actually finished capturing the city. Let's be honest. Even Pergosian said they never finished capturing it. So uh, he said they captured ninety nine percent, and that was good enough for him. Um, so. Uh, imagine Wagner going back into the city and <laughs> fighting again. It would, must be so miserable. It would, I can't imagine like the morale hit Lee. that would have. <laughs> it's like, finally, yeah. we left the city. Oh, God, we're going back. But more importantly, if Putin actually had to ask them to do that, and there was somehow an impetus and a pathway for him to do so, I think that would be... Um, not useful at home or maybe uh, instructive as to how the general public feels about Wagner in general. Yeah, I mean, Wagner, uh, from my understanding, they're going to be part of the, the Russian army. So I imagine, like, I don't know, like Constantine, how do you think that they would absorb Wagner I think he got abducted by aliens too. Oh, okay. C3. <laughs> oh, Constantine has gone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think, okay. If, if I were in Russia's situation, I would not want Wagner all in one place because I don't trust them. I would split them up and, and put a little bit of them all over the place. I wouldn't want them all in one place. They just had a mutiny. <laughs> Why would you put them all in one place? Just so they can mutiny again. <laughs> like, I don't know. The counterpoint, though, is that if you split them up and they start influencing the regular forces around them towards their leanings, um, you suddenly have a much wider swath of people who may not be willing to follow um, their commanders into battle and may be willing to follow Prigozhin. But I'd be interested to hear, Charles, what you think on that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I was thinking about it earlier. I, I don't know if I, were, if I were the Russian army, I don't know whether I would even try to integrate kind of the long-term Wagner cadre guys. Um, I mean, the basic foot soldier, the penal colony, uh, penal soldiers, the convicts and stuff. Yeah, you can just integrate them into your frontline mobilized kind of units. But yeah, the long term people, the guys who were in Syria, Mali, you know, maybe they were contract soldiers in the Russian military um, pre war and then joined and then joined Wagner. I don't even know if I'd even try to integrate those guys in. Um, you could exile them to like some kind of training battalions in Belarus. Um, and that might be the, the least politically challenging way to do it. I think that's basically what Wagner is <laughs> because you know, Russia has been doing a lot of their training in Belarus and they're sending Wagner to Belarus. I, I don't think that's a coincidence. <laughs> I think that's, that's like, they're, they're going to be training people. I think that's kind of, that's how I interpret it anyway. Uh, Belarus, they've been kind of, uh, you know, Lukashenko has been scratching Putin's back by training, training his troops when at the same time, he doesn't want anything to do with this war. And he doesn't seem to want much to do with Putin either. He's just kind of, uh, he's kind of trying to just stay out of it and play stupid, but, uh, that's what I get out of it anyway. So, um, yeah, so People, people are saying only two thousand uh, Wagner joined the Russians. I, I don't put much stock in that number. Uh, I think it's way too early to tell what exactly is going on, um, other than uh, Putin um, offered Wagner to to join the army. Um, the it might be an offer today, and the offer, um, you know, it could be like you know, like Darth Vader. You know, he may uh, alter the agreement and uh, make Wagner pray that he doesn't alter it further. You know what I mean? 
So uh, just because he offered them to join now doesn't mean he won't make them join against their will later. Uh, anyways, so uh, south of, of Bokmut, um, I, I, I have no particular news. Last time I talked about how, you know, uh, Ukraine has moved up to this, this forest strip, which is um, just north of uh, Klashivka. And they also moved into this, the, the well, they, they absolutely control the southern part of the uh, Bakhmut Dachas. And uh, there seems to be uh, heavy fighting going on in, in this forested area here. So, um, uh, so the, nothing has really changed here other than Russia is trying to counterattack to push them away. And uh, so far that's failed. Uh, I, I have no other news from uh, Klashivka. Uh, it seems, um, there's really like nothing, <laughs> there's no news from here. Um, there, there's no videos, there's no official statements and, uh, all the satellite imagery is just, just big white fluffy clouds. So there's, there's no, there's nothing really to talk about here. Um, south of Klashivka, close to, uh, Kurdyamivka, Ukraine has, uh, taken all of the land to the west of the canal. Uh, which is pretty cool, and I forgot to mark this on my map, uh, so I'm going to do this later, but uh, Ukraine is fighting along whatever this is. I don't actually know what these are. It's like mini canals. It's like like little tiny canals that connect the canal. Anyway, I don't know what these are, but there's there's fighting along whatever these things are, uh, right in, in kind of this tiny itty-bitty tree line. So, um, so yeah. So Ukraine has made it up to approximately right here, um, as of the uh, video footage that we have taken by a drone. Uh, it's possible that they've gone even further. Perhaps they're even in the town. Who knows? Um, so uh, that that's kind of the the, the Kurdyamivka area. As for uh, Ozyanivka, um, there's no particular news. Um, you, I mean, other than Ukraine controls uh, this area to the west of the canal, they now control basically everything to the west of the canal down to um, uh, Mayorsk, basically. Um, but other than that, no particular news in this area. <laughs> I don't know. Have you, uh, th there, were, there were some videos of uh, combat here. Uh, Charles, did you, did you see those uh, combat videos of them clearing the, these trenches? Yeah. Yeah, from the 3rd Special Assault Brigade, their yeah. videos. Yeah. Yeah, I saw those. Yeah. Um, yeah, more more of the same that we've seen from them. Tactically very adept. Um, clearly, they've been working together for a very long time. They work well together, or at least in the videos that we see from them. Um, it's, I mean, it's they're so good in in these videos that you could actually just use them as as training videos for any army about how to do things. Um, so yeah, I don't know whether all of their units are that way, but y you can tell by the editing. That they're actually like, like they're not spliced together, like too much. It's actually um, they're, they're quite good. Yeah. They're real good. There's, there's. I think, I think it was the same people. Uh, there was a, a video today of them clearing, like fifteen bunkers, and uh, it was, it was a kind of an interesting video. Uh, they, they, it was probably hours and hours of work, but they they cut it to like a two minute video and it's just bunker one, bunker two, bunker three, bunker four. <laughs> uh, so it was clearing tons and tons of bunkers. And uh, so it was kind of an interesting video, but, um, but yeah, th this is considered one of Ukraine's best brigades. Um, probably one of the, uh, one of the best at um, actual combat experience and also one of the best at training standards. So it really is one of the, the best brigades in the whole army. So uh, it makes sense that they're, they're pretty professional. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, not much else to, to, to really talk about in this area. Now getting down to Avdivka is uh, a bit more interesting. Uh, this afternoon, there was a video um, that depicted a few Russians who were running from approximately right here. Uh, they ran across this field 
into this little forest strip and somewhere approximately here um, they were spotted by a Ukrainian drone and then somewhere approximately here um, they started getting shelled uh, and it did not go well for the Russians. <laughs> uh, I'll just put it that way. It, 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 it didn't go well for them. They're running across a giant field getting shelled <laughs> the entire time. Uh, not, not a great idea. And uh, also, this forest isn't really a forest anymore. It's more like a pile of dead trees. So um, it's not a good place to hide. <laughs> uh, so I, it just did not go well for those Russians. So um, uh, you, you might even be able to say this is a gray area. Uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with calling this a gray area at this point, uh, considering Russians can't even get there anymore. Um, now going south a little bit, uh, I, I have no news, uh, from Vesely. I have no news from Kamyanka. I have, um, no news from whatever this is called. I forgot the name of it. Okay. So going south, um, here, south of Evdivka, across the main highway, um, there were videos today, uh, multiple videos, of uh, Russian drones, uh, FPV drones, striking Ukrainian positions. So they were hitting, uh, I'm going to go to Google, just because uh, it might be easier to see in Google. Um, okay, so... Okay. Go find it again. Okay, so uh, where am I? <laughs> Got lost. Uh, okay, so it's approximately here. Um, I'll just get the coordinates. It'll be easier. <laughs> uh, Okay, so as I awkwardly copy and paste the coordinates into the thingy. Uh, oops. Uh, anyways, um, how you doing? So this is... I know you were talking about attacks east and northeast of Avdivka is is this a uh, is this new just within the last like three or four days this attack south I don't know when this happened I just know that these are positions that were in Russian control and now they aren't <laughs> they're definitely not so this is the position here so we can see that um, this is uh all trench line these are super old trenches dating back probably nine years at this point um, this trench line I don't actually know where it ends um, I know it's here it might end here honestly wherever this trench line ends was the 2014 border I think it was right here I think this was the end because there's I don't see trenches in this area and then at some point yeah right here um, you see the Russian trench start so uh, Somewhere in this area was the, uh, the, basically the border ever since like 2015 or whatever date it was when they set this border. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Ukraine was pushed back kind of to this forest and they've now pushed back down. I don't know the timeline of when this occurred, but it has happened. In addition, they've also retaken this bridge. Um, they are in these trenches here. I don't know how far south uh, this trench system kind of goes uh, down to here. So this, this position here, I can't remember what it was called, but this was a major defensive position for Ukraine. Uh, they lost it uh, last year. I actually have the date marked here. So it was uh, August 2nd of last year. Oops, wrong button. Uh, so they lost to this August 2nd of last year. Um, this trench, I believe, or maybe whatever, wherever this trench ends was the uh, the border. Um, 
because there will be a it'll end and there'll be a gap and then the Russians will start. Um, but anyways, so this this was a, an important defensive position. I can't remember what the name was, um, but it was captured by Russia. They pushed up, captured this, kept going, and Ukraine basically fell back to here, and now they are pushing back. So they're getting closer and closer to the um, the pre twenty fourth um, border in this area. It's even possible that they've pushed past that 24th border, um, given that they have moved to this trench line and the other trench is only a few, you know, 100, 200 meters away. Um, it's possible they've moved all the way to this trench. Uh, we have no proof of that, um, but we also, uh, until uh, this morning, we had no proof that they're here. So who knows? So who knows where they are the, right now? I wish, I know there's like, uh, I'm surely there's lots of people who follow this um, war and don't pay attention to your streams. The part that I think that they miss because they don't is how um, small the little pieces that you're taking back are and how much time it takes to do that. And that like the amount of fighting and strategy and tactics and artillery and all of these other things that all have to go into taking that tiny little piece of land back um, and lives, obviously, is crazy compared to the size of the piece of land that you're taking back there. And I think people um, get uh, distracted by the idea that every offensive should be like Kharkiv last year and should just be giant swaths of land immediately and that's just not the way things work um and until you see it on a map like this and and watch the tiny little incremental pieces coming back it's really hard to grasp that concept and i wish more people would pay attention to how costly that is for the size of land that you get back yeah i mean First, you know, Russia lost hundreds of men, probably, to take these positions, uh, wounded and dead. Uh, maybe, maybe like a hundred. I don't know. You know, who knows exactly how many? So they, 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 they lost a whole bunch of guys taking these positions, and Ukraine has probably lost a bunch taking them back. So um, people are saying this is uh, the Donetsk Ring Road. No, this this position has a name, and I just forgot what the name is. <laughs> it's it's um. It's it's the something something mine shaft. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. It's the it's a mine shaft though. Um, and you can see um, this uh, like this structure right here is like uh, the mine shaft itself. It, it goes into the ground and there's a mine down there. Um, but anyways, uh, doesn't doesn't really matter that much. Uh, but this this was a a named defensive position that they lost i just i can't remember the name um so yeah uh let's go back to the map so anyway so they ukraine has recaptured this position recaptured this position they probably control this other area in between i just marked it as a gray area for now um this is zenit um i remember some of the names of these places that's zenit um i believe uh this position was called slab um and it was lost without a fight, and the commander there was very upset about that. Um, yeah. And then there's um, this this position is called Ant Hill, and um, this position is called Cuckoo. Um, Russia posted a video of Cuckoo saying that they had captured Ant Hill, and uh, a lot of the uh, Ukrainian soldiers were making fun of them because they filmed a, their big propaganda video not even on Ant Hill. They filmed it on Cuckoo. But anyways, <laughs> um, so we can move on. Uh, over the, the weekend, or, or yeah, over the weekend, uh, there was uh, some pretty solid evidence that Ukraine had moved up and captured um, this part of uh, Pervomaisky. Um, the Russians were shelling um, this house here and these houses and these houses um, pretty heavily. Um, today, 
the Russians released a video of an FPV drone strike on one of these houses. I think it was that house. Um, it was the same house they're shelling. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so this 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 area is definitely retaken by Ukraine at this point. Uh, don't know exactly how far, but we know that they've gone up at least to these houses. Uh, they seem to be getting ever closer to Pisky, and um, this position here is called. Uh, right, where am I? Uh, um, I forgot where I am. Uh, let me. I have this marked on the map. Let me let me use my cheat sheet. Where's my where's my cheat sheet go? <laughs> my cheat sheet went away. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there's Republica Mist there. I can't remember which one's Republica Mist. I think this one's Republica Mist. I think this one's Republica Mist. Or maybe that one is. I can't remember. I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> anyway, so it's Republica Mist. Anyway, so that, that's another famous position. There's a lot of articles written about it. Um, so moving on south, there's no particular news from this area. We went over news here last week, but this was uh, this is the position where Ukraine has crossed that uh, pre twenty fourth border and retaken a uh, Russian trench line that um, you know Ukraine hasn't touched since uh, before twenty fourteen. So that's pretty cool. Um, no particular news from. Um, Marinka, no particular news from uh, Mikolaivka or Pobieda, uh, no particular news from Fuladar, um, no particular news from any of these areas, uh, Novo Mayorsky, Novo Donetsky. Okay, so there was a video of a Ukrainian attack right here, right at this intersection. Um, I don't know when this attack was, because on the satellite imagery, I, like we knew that there was an attack here already, which isn't shocking because we know that Ukraine captured this town at one point and then they lost it. Um, so the, we, we know that Ukraine, um, they came, um, they basically came from uh, Zolotoneva. They, they kind of uh, drove down this road, I think, and then they kind of went over here at some point and then they went down this road and then here, or... or while going down here, they kind of turned off and attacked the town from the west, and then they kind of went down here and they attacked here. So we know that Ukraine attacked uh, the town in the west and this intersection. They moved through the town. They captured the town. They held it for like a day, and then Russia counterattacked. Uh, Ukraine withdrew. They lost a whole bunch of vehicles here, lots of... Um, I don't know, they lost like six, eight, ten vehicles here. There was lots and lots of uh, Russian propaganda about all those lost vehicles. So now there's another video of Ukraine attacking this position. And when I look at it, I cannot tell if that video is new or if this is the video of the original attack. So for that reason, I, I've kept this as a Russian controlled because I'm assuming that this video is old. It could be new, though. I really don't know. Uh, so, so yeah, that that's kind of uh, one piece of news that came out today. Uh, no particular news about uh, kind of uh, the Staromayorsky and you know, Zhiny area. Um, obviously, uh, Ukraine captured Rivnipil, which was exciting, but uh, we kind of knew that already because there's no obvious signs of fighting there for about two weeks. So, uh at least, I, I, uh, the last stream I talked about how it was almost certain that uh, Ukraine had captured this, and, and they certainly have. So now they're moving down south. Uh, there's unfortunately no satellite imagery from here from the past week uh, due to inclement weather. It's been very cloudy. Um, so we don't know what has advanced since um, the 22nd was the last... Uh, image we have. So we don't know what's happened since the 22nd, but on the 22nd, we saw heavy fighting on this tree line all the way up to here. Um, as he, as you went west, uh, the fighting became lesser and lesser. So the, the uh, really, really heavy signs of fighting here and 
lesser signs here and much lesser here. So I interpreted that as back here is almost certainly Ukrainian controlled. This middle area, Ukraine controls some of it. I don't know where it ends. They they might they probably control like up to here at least. And and then this middle this uh western part is likely Russian. It's possible Russia has completely lost all of this already and they've been pushed back to um just like a river, I think. Uh, I think it's a river, but I don't know what it's called. Anyway, so I think they've been pushed back to this river. It's likely. But there's no satellite imagery and no other evidence. There's no video evidence. So you can't conclusively say it, but it's very likely they've been pushed back to this river. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's no particular news about anywhere... Um, kind of west of Rivnabil, this this whole area, uh, no particular news anywhere here, um, no particular news, up until we get to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Robotna. Robotna. I practiced how to say this word so many times before the stream, and I forgot. <laughs> Ghost was with me. He was he was there when I was practicing. He was practicing with me, and I forgot. <laughs> Ghost, I failed. <laughs> anyway, so um, anyway, so there's there's a lot of big changes here. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go to the satellite imagery because I, I think the the satellite kind of speaks for itself. So I'm gonna figure out where I am and go there. Because uh, this is this is pretty exciting stuff uh, that we have actual legit evidence of uh ukrainian advance um i have to go to today's satellite um okay so on this imagery we we see there's super heavy shelling right here um which is new uh, it's not all new but it's part it's partially new. Um, similar uh, here is also super heavy shelling. This is even heavier. Um, this we see pretty heavy shelling up here too, and up here. So most, uh, not most, uh, a lot of the shelling is is brand new. Um, similarly, this whole area is getting torn to pieces, um, all the way over to kind of over here ish. So um, prior to there. Uh, prior to this, I, I had the Ukrainian line roughly up here. I, I've since moved it down. Uh, and you can see it on the map here. So I had the line here, and I've moved it down to here based on, on this shelling pattern that I see. Um, uh, similarly, um, in this section here... Um, <laughs> Uh, Charles, we can see lots of Miklik, uh, Miklik action going on up here. And uh, Ukraine s certainly controls this these fields, and they, they likely control up to around here. Um, I don't think they control down here. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much how I've mapped it. I, I've mapped it kind of up to uh, this, this tree line here. And so the Miklix would be around here. Uh, now, um, to the, the east, um, there's a pretty, um, I would say moderate shelling, um, throughout this field, um, and along, uh, this northern and western part of this tree lines, which I've also marked as, uh, almost certainly Ukrainian controlled at this point. So this is my map for Ukrainian control. Um, so we have just this, these uh, two advances. Uh, so yeah, that that's kind of the the, the big change that uh, that we got today from the satellite imagery. Um, Ukraine is getting ever closer to uh, Rabitny. And uh, I guess uh, we might see, uh, there are rumors that Ukraine is getting ready for an assault on the town. I don't know if those rumors are accurate. Um, uh, 
yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we're we're getting closer. Uh, this this tree line here, uh, this this main tree line, has been torn to pieces of artillery. This artillery is probably Ukrainian artillery. Uh, we've seen a lot of Russian tanks moving up this uh, this tree line, and a lot of these tanks have been destroyed by Ukraine. So Russia has lost a lot of armor trying to defend this tree line and defend uh, this kind of the this kind of T intersection up here. They've been they didn't want Ukraine to get this close to Rybitny, uh, um, but they they got here. Just to say the most like kind of girly thing ever, watching all these trees get destroyed is really making me into a tree hugger. Um, and I literally appreciate the hell out of the trees that I have around my house now. It's crazy how sad this is. Yeah, so the this is what I mean by these trees just uh, getting deleted. So, uh, like here, <laughs> you came in, there's no green. It's just all, it's all just gone. So, uh, yeah, so uh, we've we've seen a lot of Russian tanks get destroyed here as well. It's it's possible uh, Ukraine is moving up to this uh, up to the, the main town through this route. Um, I find it unlikely personally, um, at least at this point. But it's possible. It's possible they've moved up. So yeah. So the, there's so if they take that tree line out though. There's not like a lot of other cover to get up to the town you're pretty much in the wide open well there are parallel tree lines they they've only totally demolished one tree line <laughs> it's just this these trees in particular are the ones they don't like uh there's there's this tree line that you could use there's this one too and and this one is also getting torn apart um but but these two these two parallel ones are also get you this one gets you most of the way this one gets you all the way mm -hmm. uh so it's not the only option. There's also um, these trees here that you could move up on the diagonal. Uh, and I, I don't know if you could use this road for cover. Um, maybe. Let's look. Uh, we need to look at it in 3D, though. Uh, we have a question for you, Charles. Shoot. Uh, have you seen... Ukraine use a pubs. Uh, I don't know what an a pub is. I don't is either. The, I was hoping you would. <laughs> is is that is that the is that the portable Miklik the the man the backpack one? I'm not sure. I don't. I don't have the YouTube stream open, so I don't see the questions. But uh, I think that maybe what they're referring to. No, haven't seen it. Um. Eventually, I I can't remember the acronym for it. That's why I'm not sure. But there is a there's a, a man portable in a backpack, um, Miklik that yeah basically fires a a little rocket like a model rocket size kind of thing, and pulls out a charge behind it, and it clears if I remember correctly from the manual 25 meters enough just for a person to run through so it's not a vehicle lane it's just a personal lane um haven't seen them no speaking of talk mac um i, I just want to just want to show something uh so um i believe a uh m777 has a range of 30 kilometers i believe so uh, I just put kind of a circle in the middle of uh, Tokmak. Um, so this is the the thirty kilometer range of a uh, of a M triple seven. So uh, Tokmak is now in M triple seven range uh, from Ukraine's current positions. Uh, this would be like you know a max load <laughs> type thing. Uh, so not not comfortable artillery range but it's is within artillery range of just basic tube artillery at this point uh caesars etc also uh can shoot it but they've they've been able to shoot it for a while now so uh so within um Tokmak is now within uh pretty 
comfortable artillery range. So you you could set up an M777 kind of like over here and, and shoot it. Uh, it'd be max load though, obviously. Uh, Excalibur is even longer range. Excalibur is like 40 kilometers. So that would be, this, this circle would be Excalibur range. Uh, so, so yeah. Uh, that's, that's that. Um, so there's, there's one last area to talk about. Um, and it is, uh, the islands of, uh, in, in the Dnipro <laughs> and around the, uh, Antonevsky bridge. Um, so we have news that, uh, seems to be, it, it started out as rumors, but it seems confirmed to me at this point that Ukraine uh, controls the area immediately under the bridge. Um, and they also appear to control these dachas. Um, in addition to that, they, uh, today I got evidence that they control this, like, boat area. I don't know what this is called. Uh, it's like a... <laughs> anyway, so they control that. And uh, they also control um, these two islands. And the reason we know that they control them is because Russia decided to fire toss at them today. Or not today, but they... they showed the video today uh they they lit this island up with toss or both of these islands actually um so this this whole area here got shot by uh toss so those are thermobaric rockets that do a ton of damage um the video uh, of the of this toss strike uh the ukrainians were in a boat and the boat kind of drove off and as the boat was driving off the whole area got shot by toss um, I don't know if they let people off the boat before the boat drove away or if they were all on the boat. Um, but either way, there was a boat driving this way as this was all exploding. Um, and you can sort of see that in this, this image. Uh, actually, you can't, you can't see the boat, but these, these are the toss strikes. Uh, these are the toss strikes and, uh, there's a boat like over here. Actually, I think that's the boat. No, it's not. There's a boat over here somewhere. Uh. So there's not an image. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, the, uh, and they, they also, I believe also control this Island. It's possible. They also control this Island. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. And, uh, these islands are also possibly controlled by Ukraine. Um, in other in, 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 in other words, um, before the dam collapsed, Ukraine controlled all of these islands here. They controlled this Island and this Island. They controlled this island and this island. Um, they controlled these islands, this island, and these dodges. Um, so more or less, what I'm saying is that it's, it's likely that Ukraine now controls everything that they controlled before the dam collapsed, plus, in addition to all of that, this area near the Antonevsky Bridge. Um, so this, this area near the bridge is really the biggest change. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, I assume Russia controls this part of uh, these dachas or whatever this is, but uh, these like summer homes. Uh, I assume Russia controls this area because they have BTRs and BMDs and all their other uh, armored personnel carriers driving around here. Uh, they lost... Uh, two vehicles in the past two days. Uh, one was a BTR and the other was a BMD. Uh, they both were destroyed in the same way. And that was um, remote mines. So Ukraine, on uh, they have artillery set up over here, probably, um, probably around here, I imagine, uh, just due to uh, the Russian shelling. Uh, they're very heavily shelling here. So I assume that's where they are. Uh, they they have uh, artillery set up somewhere around here, uh, and they are shooting mines onto this road. So whenever Russia crosses the road and they get over here, they they sit around shooting their uh, you know twenty millimeter cannons until they run out of ammo, basically, and they run back home. And when they run back home, they hit a mine and explode. So that's kind of uh, been a pattern going on for a few days. Um, so I, I assume that this area is currently in Russian control. Some people are claiming it's Ukrainian control. I find that far, far fetched. Um, and, uh, Russia definitely controls Oleshki. 
which is so this town here. That bridge, though, um, what's the advantage of taking that bridge back? Because my understanding was that you can't really use it to transport every, anything over. Right? Um, you no, that, that bridge is obliterated, but there are advantages. Right. Um, you can hide under the, it. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, um, they're going to have... Um, infrastructure around there that allows you to have either better embarkation debarkation points and there's roads up to and away from so even if the bridge is destroyed the not necessarily the abutments and that kind of thing because that'll be quite high the way the Antonovsky bridge was built but all of that stuff around there the access roads to get underneath the bridge for maintenance or inspection or whatever, all of that stuff is really useful compared to, you know, just a, an empty, um, um, uh, riverbank. You, you know what I mean? I know what you mean, but hasn't most of that been targeted by Ukraine already as Russia has been using those same access roads and things like that? As a road, as a road, the bridge is useless but it's still a giant concrete structure and and like uh the, like the pillars or pylons whatever they're called anyway those are still sticking out of the water and there are like um like all of the destroyed pontoons are, are like still there i believe actually they may have been washed away with the blood anyways so uh the, the concrete structure is the valuable the valuable thing here because what Ukraine has done is they've kind of run up under this bridge and they've fortified under the bridge. So Russia can't shell them. You can't shoot them of artillery. You can only drop bombs on them. And if there's one thing we know about the Russian Air Force is that they can't aim. <laughs> so now you're asking an Air Force that can't hit the broadside of a barn to perfectly land bombs. Uh, so that's kind of the risk that Ukraine is running right now. So it, anyway, it, it's better to uh, bet on Russian bombs missing than to stand in the open and get shot by artillery. Uh, so this is the bet they've been making. You can even on this map, you can see how destroyed this bridge is by, by Gimlers. Um, so the, the satellite imagery of just the base layer map, <laughs> it's been uh, Swiss cheesed. So... Um, but yeah, the, as a as a road, the bridge is useless. But as a giant pile of concrete, it still has its useless. Uh, and um, people are asking about uh, Russia evacuating wounded. They evacuated from here. They evacuated from these houses that are next to the bridge. They moved back and kind of pulled out those guys and evacuated them. Um, so this area around the bridge... Uh, Ukraine almost certainly controls. I, I I feel very certain that they control this area, but the rest of this road, I I believe, is in Russian control. Yeah, and and that's going to be somewhat hard to take. I mean, it's not impossible, but um, like these roads in this area, like especially this main highway, it's it's embanked. It's it's above the area below it quite significantly. Um, so it's not like, how do I say this? Um, okay. by using the landings of the bridge where there's going to be, you know, a, a concrete, uh, structure at the edge of, there's going to be built up areas on the, on the North side and on the South side. Um, that would be the easiest place to build the ramps and, drive on drive off points that you would need to use vehicles or even if you're just using small rivering craft to load and unload soldiers and supplies in a quick and easy way more the supplies than the soldiers because the soldiers are pretty easy to get on and off but you know if you're you know transporting hundreds of mortar shells or thousands of rounds of of even small arms munition that gets really heavy and it gets really difficult to try to get that on and off. So you can use those, um, what's left of the bridge, uh, abutments and structures on the North and side, North and South to help you get transport, all of that stuff. Then you've got the next challenge, which is this road. This is going to be like 
a, a big embanked uh, highway that's running across uh, basically wetlands. There are some houses there uh, running along the coast. I don't know how many of them are still intact after a, the flooding. A lot, a lot of them, actually. It's, it's a surprising number. Okay. Um, but uh, to try to push down that uh, high embanked road um, will be challenging. They'll have to do it dismounted for quite a while before you could ever think of getting vehicles. But like, like before the Kohovka Dam was destroyed, um, the Ukrainians, this is, this seems to be a very valuable, um, threat that they're using here against the Russian army. I think that's why they were doing it before the dam, uh, was destroyed. And it makes sense why they're just kind of now the situation with the, with the water level has, has dropped again and they're just doing it again because it just creates another area where the Russians have to try to figure out and decide what to do. Um, it's kind of interesting to me that they even still have toss in the area to even fire those rounds on the, um, on the Island because, uh, you know, there aren't a million toss systems out there. Um, the fact that they're still watching the left bank of the Dnipro, even if it's just one is quite interesting to me. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I, I'm curious, uh, the range is, what's the range on the toss? 10 kilometers? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can't guess, remember. I think that's uh, 10 kilometers. Yeah, it's 10 kilometers. Uh, that's max range. I don't, I don't think they realistically shoot that far, but I'm just going to measure it as 10 kilometers uh, just for fun. Um, and we're going to measure it from uh, where they hit just to see like roughly where it could have been. Um, so this is uh, roughly where, where it could have been. Uh, so it could have been in Oleshki, it could have been in uh, Hola Prisnan, it could be uh, on this highway, maybe. So uh, I'm going to cut the range in half, because I think the half is actually more realistic. So, uh, so yeah, that kind of narrows it down, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyways, so, uh, so yeah, it seems that they have a toss running around here somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe it will get hit by a drone and explode. Who knows? They give up a, a pretty big uh, radar signature when they shoot, and it takes them a while to get going after they shoot. So they become a, a vulnerable target to something like an FPV drone. If you have one handy and in range, and you can get there, uh, it's a target you could take out. High priority target. Ukraine hates those things. They are deadly. So, uh, yeah, they're definitely not cool. Sorry, I just have to step away. Um, so my apologies for yeah, no problem. to leave. But thank you for having me. I always love coming and asking questions, and I will see you all next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you for Bye. coming. Bye. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Um, we've got another question. What is the logistical probability that Ukraine is able to sustain operations across the Dnipro? Um, we have to keep in mind that I've heard two numbers thrown out. I've heard the number 70 and the number 120. Now, I originally heard that there were 50 men there, and then I heard there were 70 men. And then I heard someone say that there was 120, which happens to be 70 plus 50. <laughs> so I think that person may have been confused because I think there's only 70 guys here. So that's what, two platoons? Um, maybe a company. So we're, we're talking about two platoons or a company worth of guys. And these guys aren't all in one place. It's like all of this. <laughs> Okay, so we're not talking giant numbers of people across the river. Um, so I, I think Ukraine can sustain this number of, of men. Uh, Charles, what do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's just light infantry, uh, yeah, they, that's certainly sustainable, no problem. I mean, that's you know three observation posts basically, um, or something like that. It it gets exponentially more difficult the more firepower you try to put across. So um, it starts with just larger crew serve weapons like uh, 50 caliber machine gun and, um, you know, larger mortars. Um, you know, and it couldn't even, you'd, for a 120 mortar, you would be just difficult because you'd need a piece of equipment to, to kind of carry the thing around and the shells. And, and then we haven't even gotten to you know, a one, one, three or a BMP. Um, once you start getting into vehicles, it just gets more complicated because now you've got fuel, you've got to get over there. Um, not just the ammunition. Then you start talking about like a main battle tank and then it just gets more com I mean, so I don't think I don't, I, it's certainly anything is possible. Um, I mean, if they wanted to run barges across the river, and they wanted to push uh, mechanized forces across the river. You know, it's it's doable, um, but is it is it worth it? Um, because it's going to be so much effort to try to sustain them. You're going to have to continually move your um, your embarkation disembarkation points um, because of artillery. Um, so it, it, it's possible. I just. I find that like a, a deeper attack across the river is unlikely um, simply because of the logistical challenge that it entails. How the Russians maintained their Kherson pocket for so long, I think is actually quite an impressive feat. Um, even the barge bridge that they built uh, underneath the Antonovsky bridge, I, I mean, I have to give the engineers who did that some credit because that is really difficult. Um, and we saw what a bad idea it was because it only stood there for like four days before it got hit by high Mars and, and was basically sunk. Um, they had a couple of extra barges, they pulled them in, they fixed it. And then like, it was two days later and it got hit again by high Mars and was sunk and it was unusable, uh, for vehicle traffic. But in itself, it was, it was, a quite the engineering feat um so yeah it, for me the logistics just becomes exponentially more difficult the more firepower you try to push across and if you want to make further advances you're going to need more firepower um the scatterable mines are great for taking out these vehicles that we saw like today um but there's a limit to what light infantry can can do and and carry yeah and um they are really dependent on the Ukrainian forces on the other side of the river, which is why today uh, Russia just completely lit up everything. <laughs> yeah, the, this whole area was just on fire. Uh, with they hit it with incendiaries and just loads of artillery. Just this whole area just got lit up because they were sick and tired of. Uh, Ukrainian ATGMs and Ukrainian artillery and uh, tanks and mortars and everything that Ukraine has over here that is supporting these infantry, uh, Russia's upset by them. <laughs> uh, I have, so this is kind of an image of of just everything was on fire today. <laughs> they were not happy. Um, so they're they're very reliant on the heavy weapons being just across the river, helping them out. Uh, there there's no way they could sustain themselves i think without that support yeah and uh so yeah this is uh i think um i mean this is this is something that could take literally months and months to happen but i think if if ukraine can get across this uh island and take control of this whole section of highway. I imagine this bridge might uh, be destroyed at some point. But if they can get all the way across and uh, you know start threatening to cross, it might give them enough distance to start uh, you know crossing heavier equipment across the river and start doing a, a more legitimate attack. But this this is this could take months. 
uh, and and, it, and this might not even be the location they choose to attack. Um, you know, they could choose to attack uh, uh, down here. They could choose to just drive across <laughs> up here, you know, because uh, it's, it's all drag out, you know, maybe. It, anyway, so there's uh, there's other options. Um, there's there's here, uh, which might be easier to cross. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, so uh, I think we're months away from uh any major developments right now it's mostly just uh, special forces raiding and light infantry uh, and we'll we'll see what comes of it the, the dam collapsing really set ukraine back a lot um but um i think they're they're trying to make it back as quickly as possible because they don't want russia to take that ground and uh fortify it And yeah, there's there's no yeah. evidence that Ukraine crossed the vehicle. Uh, the Russians just made that up. They make up a lot of things. There was uh, one topic I had, Andrew. Uh, I don't know. Did you see? Um, there was a video. I, I saw it today. I don't know when it was from. But it was um, Ukrainian soldiers basically stuck in a landmine. Uh, or in a land in a minefield um trying to do kazivak uh with a bradley um did, did you see this video you know which one i'm talking about yeah i've seen it yeah it's it's not for i don't think it's certainly not to show but um i know it was commented a lot on social media and posted a lot particularly by pro-russian sources saying oh look you know we're totally destroying them but um I watched that really closely. I just, I've got a few thoughts on it. If people have seen it. Um, and it kind of goes back to when we were talking about breaching on one of your earlier streams. And, um, I don't know exactly what happened, but cause obviously it, it, the, it, the video kind of starts after, um, you know, the casualties have already been taken and, and stuff like that. But there's some interesting stuff in the video. So, one is, you know, we were talking about engineer reconnaissance and the importance of knowing where the minefield starts. Um, what it looks like to me, what happened is that they were trying to do a breach. They fired a Miklik. Like in the video, you can actually see the Miklik cable laying on the ground. And you can see the blast of the Miklik or the, the blast crater mark of the Miklik down in, in the background, like a couple hundred meters beyond them. And what it looks like happened to me is, is that they misjudged where the start of the minefield was. Um, and this can happen very easily. Like we talked about how mines are often laid in patterns and, and things like that. Um, it's totally possible for a vehicle to drive into a landmine and the first mine that they hit can be actually in the, in the, in the minefield, like not the first line or the second line, but further in. And the natural tendency is to think, oh, this is where the minefield starts. But in actuality, you're already in it. Um, another thing that's common practice is that you will lay the mines at the beginning of the minefield in a lower density. So the chance of somebody finding them or the chance of somebody hitting them is lower. And then as the as you move into the into the minefield, the density increases to exactly to try to get this kind of thing to happen, where uh, the enemy gets into it before they realize that they're already in the minefield. So. The Ukrainians fired a Miklik uh, to breach this minefield. It's just that where the Miklik charge was, was already kind of in it. And here you see either Overwatch forces or forces trying to go through that Miklik lane. Um, you know, the lane was too deep. It was already, it was already, you know, they had to go through a minefield to even get to the lane. What I saw in terms of casualty evacuation was actually fine. Um, I know it's it's not a beautiful picture, but there was uh, first aid being rendered. The vehicle was was more or less stationary um, because it's now in a minefield. People were retracing their steps. 
not everybody retrace steps. That is not the right way to do it. You need to basically retrace wherever you walked um, to try to get back out of it. Um, but what was interesting was is that you can see the Miklik cable laying on the ground. So they were actually, tr this was not a, a surprise that there was a minefield there. They just misjudged where the beginning of it was. Um, and um, so I know that it's promoted by Russians as uh, this is horrible and, and it is to see, but um, actually there's a lot of things that are going right there um, in terms of casualty evacuation, in terms of how to go through a minefield um, and actually how to act inside of a minefield. There's a lot going right there. Um, uh, they just, uh, they misjudge the, the, the beginning of the minefield of where it started and, um, and it caught them. And that's a totally normal, common thing to have very, to find it difficult to know when does the actual minefield start. And they're designed in such a way to make that even more difficult to determine. You know what I mean, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, that video really bothered me and it wasn't really, um, the video itself that bothered me. It was, uh, the Russian reaction to it that really angered me. So I, I did not analyze that video. I was like, just, I was just furious <laughs> to be honest. Uh, oh, so, I totally understand. So, I would, I felt the same way. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I, I never, I didn't like geolocate the video or anything. Uh, I, I honestly didn't even watch the whole thing. Uh, I didn't want, uh, but anyways, so I, I, I assume it was here. Uh, they fired a lot of mick clicks here, <laughs> but, uh, I, I assume that's where it was. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm sure someone probably geolocated it. I, I didn't, I just didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> Uh, it could have also, maybe that's, I can't tell if that's a mic click or not, but, uh, but yeah, anyways, so this is, this is what mic clicks look like on, on the satellite imagery. Uh, they fire these, these, uh, what are they, a hundred meter long, uh, cables full of explosives. They blow up and make a little, uh, hundred meter long hole in their minefield, um, Ukraine fired like four or five of them or six of them or whatever in this little area. I can't really tell. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of craters here. Can't really tell how many they fired, but they fired a bunch. Um, not entirely sure why they fired this many. Uh, I don't know if they're making more roads or if there was just multiple minefields. I, I don't know. Um, so well, one thing I've seen a lot more of, which is good is, um, is them firing them end to end. Um, I actually saw one, I think I saw one video where they were combining the, the UR 77 and the, and the American, the M50, I think it's the 58. Um, but they're firing them end to end, which is, which is great. I think kind of early on when we're seeing a lot of use, we're seeing them fired a lot next to one another, like some of the images we saw before, which is okay. I don't know what. <laughs> you went you went robot mode <laughs> yeah. but yeah i think i think we understand what what charles was saying there it doesn't really make much sense to fire two parallel lines it makes more sense to fire them into one big line than two parallel lines um i wonder if he's gonna come back <laughs> I'm back. Sorry. Okay, um, you're back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I had a connection issue. It happens. <laughs> he said the 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 robot knee got you. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, but yeah, I didn't. I mean, it, it's it is a horrible image, and and but I just I know that a lot of people have seen it, and so I just wanted to talk about it because what I saw was obviously was, it was horrible. It was the images of war. And, um, but from a training and tactics and all of that, like I saw a lot of good things in that video in terms of, all right, yes, this horrible situation has happened, but in general, I mean, 
it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't bad in terms of what the ukrainians were doing it was uh it was uh it was the right the right way to react to all of this stuff and um yeah it's it's really easy to to misjudge kind of the beginning of of a minefield um how yeah, how do easy. how do you judge the beginning is it would it be like a a guy like walking up and looking like uh how would you how would you do it yep that's pretty much it yeah um with a with a mine detector um going out there crawling around trying to find them there are other indicators that you can use um but right now it's so difficult because a lot of these minefields have been in there for so long and you know the vegetation has grown up in the spring around these mines like it's not easy to find these things um yeah um uh, just you know hope that we can get through these mine belts as quickly and as safely as possible and and uh get back into some kind of open country i have um, i have heard i don't I, I think you've heard this too but uh i've heard that if you fly a drone at a specific time of day like just after the sun goes down um the difference in temperature between the mine and the dirt um, is significant enough that the drone can just see all the mines. Uh, yeah. Okay. I've, uh, I've, yeah. I've seen I've seen some videos of that. What, what do you think of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So since this war has started and we've been talking about landmines a lot, I have heard and seen a lot of potential solutions to this. And I think it's great. They need to keep innovating. And people talk about um, uh, LIDAR and they talk about ground penetrating radar and put ground penetrating radar on a drone and, and fly it over the fields and stuff like this. And in theory, um, all of these are doable. Um, so infrared even, or, you know, thermal signature. Yes, uh, it will work if you have just the right conditions. So if you have the right thermal signature, the right time of day, whatever, um, if they, especially if they are metal encased mines, which um, there are TM62s that have metal casings, there are some that have plastic casings, um, uh, they're, and they're surface laid. Um, you know, we're not talking about a lot of surface laid minefields right now in, in the way, in the areas that we're, that we're looking at. Um, most of them are buried. So that's not going to work. Um, ground penetrating radar. So I used ground penetrating radar quite a lot uh, in my time in the service. We had it. Um, and ground penetrating radar is fantastic, but it picks up absolutely everything. Like a good mine detector, just the metal detector, you can actually tell kind of what it is. Like if you have it, if you're trained well enough and you're experienced with it enough, like you can recognize a mine from a, a piece of metal or a piece of shrapnel or something like that that's on the battlefield. Ground penetrating radar is actually more difficult to determine that um, because of just the, the signature that you get back. So we actually didn't like the ground penetrating radar because we got so many false positives. Um, and that's just, it's just so annoying and it's so frustrating to get so many false positives, especially if you're dealing with I mean, you're dealing with a battlefield that's like been shelled and there's been all kinds of stuff dropped on it. And uh, if you're and in anywhere that's somewhat built up, there's going to be <laughs> bits of stuff just everywhere. Um, and that just you just it's just not feasible to to use it because you're just picking up absolutely every little thing. Um, and it's very difficult to tell what is a mine and it isn't. Now, in some areas where I could see that this may be useful, I mean, I mentioned that minefields are generally laid in patterns. And these kinds of technologies, I think, would be really useful if, you know, if you weren't necessarily trying to pinpoint the mine, but to identify certain patterns. So if you could do a whole field and you could say, all right, well, there's a whole bunch of noise here, but we can recognize the signal um, in the pattern of the mines, then that would be useful. Um, that would be great. Um, you'd still have to use a different method to really pinpoint and to make sure, you know, you were looking at what you really wanted to look at. But 
I found ground penetrating radar more frustrating than helpful. And I know that they're doing a lot of innovation with this. I even saw these um, vibration vehicles, um, which is not for detection. There's, I don't know how they could use detection for that, but um, they would be useful for, they could potentially be useful for actually detonating them. Um, so I've seen lots of technologies, but um, I'm still skeptical and, and, you know, even just following Ryan Hendrickson and even chatting with him a couple of times, um, you know, the, the, the best way is still just the classic uh, quality metal detector with a, a trained operator. Yeah, just uh, the good old fashioned techniques, huh? Yeah. And, and I, cause I remember, I, I remember I even went to like defense contractor conferences and stuff like this when I was in the army and they said, meet with these people and it was great things like their new solutions with ground penetrating radar but it was like until there's some kind of ai built on top of this or or something like that it's just it works fantastic in a sterile test environment but as soon as you get onto a messy battlefield it's just it, just, it felt worthless and we just left it in the truck I was under the impression some of them, the the newer ones had uh, like uh, some sort of AI to determine what you were looking at. I thought, I, I mean, I'm not uh, not ground radar mind detecting expert, but I remember hearing something about that. Although maybe that was just like prototypes that barely exist or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Well, it doesn't seem that, I mean, the, the AI that's applied to image analysis right now in terms of all kinds of different fields, um, I could totally see that being really helpful in mine detection and uh, mine, demining assessment phases and stuff like that. But um, I, I, and it doesn't seem like, you know, we're not talking like 30, 40 years until this technology is ready. I think it would, you know, it's, I'm sure it exists in labs now. I just don't know how much of it is in mass production and I don't know how easily it would be get to, to get to Ukraine and then test it under real world conditions. But, um, yeah, I've, I've seen lots of suggestions for technology to solve this problem. I fully am with it. I love it. Um, but I just, I haven't seen it in use in Ukraine significantly and my experience with it, albeit, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, um, when it was still in a different phase, um, wasn't that great. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I think that's the stream, Charles. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate the uh, expertise. I know the, the audience also exp uh, appreciates hearing from a, a real life engineer such as yourself. Um, it was uh, covered a lot of different news today, I think. And uh, I think it was a good stream. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew. And the sun is starting to come up in Germany. So have a great day. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, thank you for coming. And uh, thank you for everyone for listening. Um, uh, I'll have another stream on Friday. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll see you there. It will be, a, a, what is it, 9 p.m.? Uh, Central European time, which is uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so we'll see you on Friday. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. All right. So goodbye.